Hello, my name is Artur Zagadwo, and I'm a lead data scientist at DeepSense AI. In this deep talk, I will cover the topic of large language models and uh, tell you about the AI revolution that's happening right now with these modern natural language processing systems. Uh, let me start with an agenda of the talk. Uh, first, there will be a short introduction to the topic. Then we will go through uh, several applications of LLMs. Uh, then I will cover the topic of uh, transfer learning, which is the approach to training the models, uh, consisting of actually two stages, pre-training and fine-tuning. Then we will go uh, through the topics of few-shot prompting and instruction tuning, which are kind of the ways, the more modern ways of training and operating with the models. And then at the end, I will conclude with a summary slide. Since you're listening to my presentation, there is a quite high chance that you've heard of uh, ChatGPT and uh, probably you've also given it a try in practice because ChatGPT is the model that OpenAI released in November last year and it's a model that generated the unprecedented level of hype, uh, which led to only five days that it took uh, ChatGPT to reach its first uh, 1 million users, something that's never happened before. But here we are uh, four and a half months later in April 2023 and ChatGPT is no longer the most recent model from OpenAI because in mid-March, they actually announced and released the fourth version, the long-awaited uh, GPT-4, uh, which is considered, first of all, most more powerful than ChatGPT and all the previous, previous uh, language models. Uh, second of all, it's expected to also soon support not only uh, text, but also visual inputs, so we will be able to um, send images to the model and ask, for example, questions about them. And what's also interesting and what's included in the report, which I'm showing you to the uh, on, on the slide, the report that Microsoft research scientists uh, wrote based on their early experiments with GPT-4 is the fact that they decided to put a quite courageous statement in there, maybe a bit of an exaggeration, but uh, they, they wrote that they see GPT-4 as an early version of the so-called artificial general intelligence, AGI, which is kind of the uh, holy grail of AI, which we are all kind of looking for. Uh, okay, so let me now switch to applications of large language models because both ChatGPT and GPT-4 are examples of large language models. Uh, so now I will go through a list of potential use cases. The first one will be quite simple. It's a text classification. So you are asking, we can ask the model to assign uh, to our data a category from a predefined, uh, predefined list. For example, we can ask it to categorize some documents, to analyze, analyze sentiment of product reviews. So ask it if, if a given text has a positive or negative sentiment or the text uh, detect toxicity, etc. There can be many uh, use cases that can be framed as the text classification problem. Uh, another use case is text summarization. So imagine you have a long document like a news or some meeting notes or an email or a research paper that you want to, um, you, want, you want the model to make it shorter. You want it to uh, summarize it for you. That's also possible with help of large language models. Uh, another use case is question answering. So you can provide the model with some document and ask a question about it, or you can even ask a general uh, question and uh, hope that it will know the answer. And if you're afraid that the model will try to uh, come up with something that does not really exist, uh, you can also recently uh, connect it to some external knowledge base and extract information from there. Uh, another use case are chatbots, which are quite popular and uh, typically used for automating customer support, but in general, they can be used uh, as a chat interface to any application you can come up with. Another uh, useful uh, application of LLMs is semantic search. So you can ask the model to find similar texts in your historical data, in your knowledge base. And it's not only limited to, let's say, pure language, but you can also consider searching, for example, for similar alerts or IT incidents from the past. Uh, the list is long and probably uh, not exhaustive. I also put machine translation in here, named entity recognition and keyword extraction. But uh, I think that uh, you yourself can also come up with uh, more use cases uh, that 
you personally or your business can benefit from. And speaking of businesses, uh, let me tell you how businesses can actually make use of LLMs. It seems that there are two main ways to go. The first one is to connect your application to some API that serves the language model. And the most uh, popular and probably most powerful one is the OpenAI API. Uh, if you are a bit concerned with uh, your data privacy, you can also uh, check Azure OpenAI service, which is uh, proposed by Microsoft, which also serves the same, uh, same set of models that OpenAI API. Uh, they provide a selection of very powerful models, which are also easy to use, but they come at the price of money, which you have to pay for your requests. Actually, it does not uh, directly depend on the number of, of requests that you send to the models, but on the length of the texts that you send to it, because it's based on the so-called tokens. Tokens are more or less uh, compared to words. You can treat tokens as words. So the number of words in your requests uh, matters here. If uh, if you don't want to go with an API, if you want more flexibility, more uh, customization, you can look for more open alternatives. Uh, for example, those that are available in the Hugging Face model, model repository. Uh, as I said, they are more customizable and allow uh, easier adaptation to your, to your needs, to your in-house domain-specific data. Uh, such models can be hosted both on-premises and in the cloud, depending on your preference. Uh, but please remember that uh, in order to fully benefit from, uh, from an LLM, you have to make sure you have a uh, powerful enough GPU. And uh, it's also worth having uh, an MLOps strategy or best practices implemented. After this uh, more business-oriented uh, introduction, let me switch to some definitions, some theory about language modeling. So a language model, LM, is a name for an algorithm that uh, can predict uh, what should be the next element or the next word in a sequence. Or as I said, uh, in this domain of NLP, words are uh, called tokens. So what the next token in a sequence should be. How do they learn that? They learn based on large collections of texts that we provide them with. And uh, the thing that actually the, the language model knows is it knows the probability of particular sentences or texts. Based on these probabilities, we can ask the model to generate text that uh, is increasingly more uh, resem resembling texts that are written by humans. Sometimes you cannot even distinguish a text written by a model from the one written by a person. A straightforward application of uh, such language models uh, is the auto-completion feature that you can find in your messaging apps or uh, search engines. And uh, why are the models called, called large? So an LLM, a large language model, is one that has a large number of parameters. Here we are speaking about uh, neural networks and parameters or uh, so-called weights are, let's say, the numerical values that describe how the model should uh, transform the input data to its output, to its prediction. Uh, now let me say a few words about how these models uh, are trained. Uh, the typical approach to training large language models is based on the so-called transfer learning paradigm, which is a two-stage procedure. In the first stage, the so-called pre-training, as I said, we need to provide the model with large collections of texts for it to learn the general knowledge about the language. This stage is self-supervised, which means that we don't need anything else apart from the text only. Uh, no, no need for labeling the text, no need for data annotation. Uh, the model does the work itself, let's say. In the second stage, uh, we take the pre-trained model and can adapt it into our uh, towards our uh, target tasks towards the problem that we are uh, solving uh, in the so-called fine-tuning stage. This time it's typically supervised, which means that we need to prepare uh, much smaller than in the first, first stage, a smaller data set of annotated data. And speaking about data sets that are used in pre-training, these are typically mixtures of uh, many data sources, many text sources. Uh, for instance, web crawled data, Wikipedia, books, uh, and also more recently, code repositories are also included. That's how uh, language models learn to uh, program. 
there exist uh, three types of LLMs. Uh, the one that I already described are the so-called decoders, which are capable of text generation or auto-completion because they are trained to predict what the next uh, token should be. Another type um, are encoders, which are well suited for classification tasks, both text classification and single token classification, for example, named entity recognition. Uh, the third type, a more complex architecture, is the so-called encoder-decoder, or seek to seek which combines both an encoder and a decoder. And these are uh, suitable for text-to-text -text tasks, such as uh, machine translation or text summarization, in which uh, one text is converted into another text. In the following slides, I will be presenting uh, quite a lot of language models, uh, but this will only be a subset of all the uh, developed uh, ones in the recent years. If you are interested in more details, feel free to uh, check my guide, check the uh, text that I wrote about LLMs. It's available at our DeepSense AI website. If you prefer more tabular format, uh, feel free to also check my GitHub repository where I pre prepared what I called an LLM catalog. Okay, let's see how encoders compare to decoders. So I mentioned that the decoders are pre-trained in the language modeling tasks. Uh, so they, based on the so-called left context, on the past, they predict what uh, word should follow, what uh, token comes next. Uh, different to that, uh, encoders see the entire text, uh, so they see both the left and the right context, and some part of the uh, text is corrupted. For example, in the so-called masked language modeling objective, which is typically used for encoders in pre-training phase, uh, a subset of tokens is masked, is replaced with a special mask token, and the task that the model learns is to, to guess what was actually the, the word that was uh, replaced. Nowadays, encoders are still really widely used for classification tasks, but unfortunately, the way they are form formulated uh, makes them unable to generate text. So, uh, as you can uh, guess, the vast majority of recently developed LLMs are decoders because they generate text as we know well. Okay, another uh, concept that I would like to introduce is the transformer, which is a type of a neural network architecture that's based on the famous self-attention mechanism uh, that was introduced in 2017 in the uh, frequently cited paper from Google Brain researchers. Uh, I don't want to go into details of the self-attention mechanism here, uh, but I will just say that it allows the model to, to better model the co to better understand the contexts in which uh, certain words are used, and also allows the model to better uh, learn on which parts of the text it should focus when generating text. Uh, the original transformer from 2017 was an encoder-decoder uh, architecture. And uh, in that paper, they successfully applied it to the problem, the single problem of machine translation. Uh, since then, almost all new models, all new ideas in the field of natural language processing rely on this transformer architecture or the attention mechanism. Uh, then other uh, ideas around transformers started appearing, as I said. So the first transformer-based pre-trained language model was GPT. GPT from 2018, uh, as, you can, as you can guess, invented by OpenAI. It was not that large yet because it only had slightly above 100 million parameters. The next year, another version of GPT appeared in 2019. GPT-2, which was not much different, it was just larger. It reached uh, 1.5 billion parameters and it was trained on a much, much larger uh, data set. Both GPT and GPT-2 are examples of uh, decoders, so they are able to generate text. And uh, let's say as a fun fact, I added uh, an example headline from 2019. As you can see back then, uh, people were worried that GPT-2 is so good in text generation that uh, it should be kept locked up for the good of humanity. Uh, people were concerned with, with its capabilities, but nowadays with ChatGPT and the GPT-4, uh, we can only uh, laugh at these, uh, these uh, headlines from the past. And after a few months, actually, OpenAI decided to, to release uh, GPT-2 for public use. 
Okay, so uh, also researchers from Google started wondering how they can continue their transformer-based research, and they invented BERT. BERT was uh, an idea um, that was actually based on a on an encoder model able to capture bidirectional contexts. As I said, it was able to encoders are able to see both the left and right side of the text when uh, pre-training for the masked language modeling uh, objective. And BERT was a quite successful successful model. Uh, as you can see in the diagram, it's typically also used in this uh, transfer learning approach. So we pre-train it and then uh, add some more neural layers to, to tune it to be able to classify text. Uh, after the success of uh, BERT, also researchers from Facebook started wondering what they can do to actually create an even better model. They uh, did an extensive ablation study of BERT and proposed some, I would say, minor changes to BERT, and uh, this resulted with Roberta, another very popular model, this time from Facebook. Both BERT and Roberta are encoders, and they work well for sequence and token classification tasks. Uh, okay, another, another idea invented at Google is called T5, which stands for Text-to-Text -text Transfer Transformer, released by the end of 2019. And it's considered an important step towards how we actually use, how we um, operate uh, the LLMs nowadays, those chat-based uh, models. And let me now tell you why. T5 was uh, also much larger than previous models. It was 11 uh, billion parameters. And it was an encoder-decoder similar to the, to the original transformer. T5 was pre-trained uh, in a slightly different way. It was a two-stage pre-training procedure, and only the first part was self-supervised. Uh, the, the, object, the training objective, the task that T5 was trained to, was somewhat similar to BERT, because it was, it was also a so-called denoising objective, in which the parts of text were corrupted, or in this case, replaced with some other tokens. And the goal of T5 was to uh, recreate the input to denoise the uh, initially corrupted text. In this case, these were not single tokens that were, but entire spans of text. Um, let me tell you about the second stage of, of pre-training T5, which is even more important, uh, which is the uh, supervised, supervised multitask learning uh, objective. In this part, uh, I will tell you how it's simple, how it's similar to uh, the modern chat-based LLMs. Uh, so researchers at Google uh, wanted to create a single model that can handle all NLP tasks, and they came up with a uh, unified input format for all of them. Uh, how they did that? They added a task-specific prefix to each input text. As you can see, the model was able to do machine translation, classification, uh, regression, and uh, text summarization. Uh, and we were telling, they were telling the model uh, which task it's being asked to do by, by this uh, task-specific prefix. So it some, somehow resembles uh, the instructions that we are now giving to the models. And as it was supervised, it required uh, preparation of, of such uh, annotated data sets, let's say, of inputs and outputs. OK, let's switch back to um, OpenAI and what they did in 2020. In the beginning of the year, they, um, they released a paper, which they called Scaling Laws for Neural Language Models in which they describe their expectations uh, that much improvement can be gained by simply scaling the models to more parameters. They invented what they called the LM scaling laws. Uh, several uh, months later, to prove their hypothesis, they announced uh, GPT-3, uh, which was uh, the largest model back then, uh, 175 billion parameters decoder again, so GPT-3, similarly to its um, previous versions, was also a gener text-generating model. This time trained, trained on a data set of almost 600 gigabytes of text, much more than the previous versions. And uh, in the paper, they described their observation that uh, GPT-3 is able to perform a few-shot learning. Uh, I will tell you about few-shot learning in the next slide. 
But first, let me tell you about what happened next. First, uh, other companies started pre uh, started releasing or creating even larger models. First, NVIDIA, together with Microsoft in a joint effort, um, announced Megatron Turing NLG. And then Google, uh, about a year ago, released Palm, or actually wrote a paper about it. Both those models are um, above 500 billion parameters, and none of them, unfortunately, is available for public use. Um, another interesting and important uh, milestone, I would say, was the beginning of 2022 and the paper from DeepMind, in which uh, they describe a model called Chinchilla. And together with the model, which itself is not that fascinating because it's also a decoder, they uh, come up with some new LM scaling laws. Uh, they actually find out that uh, it's not only the model size that matters, but also the amount of used training data. They formulate the law, uh, widely known as the Chinchilla scaling law, is that for a given uh, computation budget, uh, you should put equal equal um, focus, equal importance on uh, scaling the training data as you are putting on the model size. They call their model compute optimal. This uh, paper, this new approach actually started kind of a new uh, mindset. It changed the mindset of uh, researchers who noticed that it's not, not necessarily uh, looking for uh, larger models that will bring uh, improvements in the field. Okay, let me now uh, get back to few shot learning. I mentioned that in GPT-3 paper, they started noticing some uh, few shot learning capabilities of the model. In the context of LLMs, uh, in fact, few shot learning is a case of inference, so which means that the model is not really being trained. We are just kind of uh, playing with the input that we are providing to the model. In case of few-shot learning, it's the so-called prompt template, which contains K examples. So uh, a few examples uh, for it to infer from and uh, decide what the prediction should be. As you can see in the slide in the example, there are two um, few-shot examples, few-shot uh, inputs and outputs. So there is text and the sentiment. For one uh, drug review, as you can see, there, the sentiment is positive. For the second one, it's negative. And we are asking the model what the sentiment of the third uh, text is. And based on the two provided examples, it should be able to uh, correctly tell us if it's positive or negative. In the GPT-3 paper, actually, K, the number of uh, few shot examples was much larger, between 5 and 100. And, uh, of course, the K was depending on the task that they were experimenting with, but in most cases it was 50 or more. So the model needed 50 or more examples to actually uh, provide um, correct predictions for the uh, text of interest that we are uh, running uh, through it. Including these few shot examples in the prompt is not really convenient. It's a bit cumbersome because uh, we need to determine which uh, examples from the training data set to put there and how many of them. And if, you, if we want to put uh, many of them, uh, it's not easy to fit them in the prompt because uh, both the inputs uh, can be long, like in, for example, uh, text summarization task. And also, if we have, for example, multi-class classification, there are many examples to be included. The, and the models have a limited context window, so uh, there is a limit of how long the text uh, can be. So what is actually desired is to make the models properly respond to unseen tasks, which are tasks that were not used in the training data, without providing examples in so-called zero-shot uh, formulation, in the zero-shot inference scenario. And the recently proposed language models are actually getting increasingly better at answering to tasks framed as zero-shot instructions. You can see an example of an, an instruction prompt uh, at the bottom of the slide. Again, uh, it's about analyzing the sentiment of drug reviews, but there are no more uh, few examples. There is just an instruction formulated, and we are telling the model what uh, should be what options it has to choose from. Mm. And we hope that it will understand the instruction. Mm. How this actually works, it's uh, again 
predicting the next token because this, uh, as I said, these modern models are mostly decoders. So they take the text that we provide them with and uh, need to, uh, based on the probabilities that it, they that they learned in the training phase, guess the next next word, next token. How do we make them know that? We do that uh, with help of instruction tuning, which is simply a term for supervised fine tuning on data sets of instructions. Instruction tuning is quite a recent uh, direction of research in NLP. It kind of started in 2021 with, uh, I would say, three notable papers about natural instructions data set, about FLAN, which are both uh, model and uh, data set, and T0 model, which is uh, based on T5, but uh, adapted to the zero uh, shot uh, learning scenario. Uh, the researchers noticed or were hoping that even better zero shot capabilities can be observed if we scale the number of tasks. So in the second wave that happened in 2022, uh, they prepared supernatural instructions and the FLAN 2022 collection. This time, uh, in the first wave, in the first wave, the data sets consisted of uh, around 60 and then uh, almost 200 tasks. But in the second wave, uh, supernatural instructions had uh, 1600 tasks and the FLAN collection was above uh, 1800. You might be wondering how they collected so many tasks in there to be included in the collection. So in supernatural instructions, they used crowdsourcing. And in FLAN, they actually combined uh, multiple previously existing data sets together. Um, this collection of data, uh, collecting these data sets was time consuming and uh, required human labor. So a recent idea appeared that uh, takes advantage of the models and we can ask the model to generate the data for us. Uh, there are two papers which I mentioned here, Unnatural Instructions and Self-Instruct, in which they asked GPT-3, uh, starting from some 175 handwritten examples, to generate more similar tasks. They ended up with 80,000 instructions generated by the model and then used the instructions to tune the model to follow the instructions and actually got quite uh, decent results with this approach. Let me show you an example, a diagram from the from one of the papers uh, to see what kinds of instructions we can we can find there. Uh, so in the blue color, you can see, uh, let's say, the normal standard instruction fine tuning, where there is an instruction and there is an answer. Uh, there is also a special uh, type of instructions, which are the so-called COT of or chain of thought uh, instructions. In this case, we are asking the model to uh, reason step by step. And also in the answer, it's very uh, detailed. It has all the reasoning steps included. And then the models trained in this, on this mixture of instructions can generalize well to unseen tasks. They can uh, do inference uh, to unseen instructions. Uh, another slide from the same paper to show you what kinds of tasks were included there. You can see a lot of uh, question answering, text generation, uh, code generation, but also more typical tasks like test, uh, text uh, categorization or toxicity detection or uh, named entity recognition. In the purple color, you can see uh, that they only included nine data sets, nine tasks for a chain of thought. But uh, this was enough to see a lot of improvement in these uh, reasoning ab abilities of the model, in this step-by-step -step reasoning. Okay, another model, which I haven't mentioned yet, which is also able to follow instructions, is InstructGPT from OpenAI, which was announced uh, in early 2022. You can find this model in their API. It's also known as Text DaVinci 003. It's a very powerful model and also a quite expensive one. And let me tell you how it was trained. So in addition to supervised instruction tuning, which I described a moment ago, uh, Instruct GPT was also trained uh, using additionally the uh, RLHF algorithm, which is reinforcement learning with human feedback. You can see the full uh, training procedure on the slide. In step one, OpenAI uh, collected 
uh, with help of humans, they collected demonstration data. So they collected uh, manually, they asked some labelers to write prompts and to write uh, desired output behaviors of the of the model. So they collected quite a large collections or quite a lar large data set of instructions and uh, answers to them. They also used uh, a subset of the prompts that early users of their API were actually uh, writing. This data was used in this standard supervised fine tuning manner to fine tune their GPT-3, uh, but this was not, not enough. Then they took the supervised tuned uh, GPT-3 model that was able to uh, generate answers to instructions and they generated multiple versions of, of answers, of responses to, uh, to the instructions from, the, from their data sets. And they asked humans for help again. This time it was not about writing answers, but uh, assessing the quality of answers, actually ranking the multiple outputs from best to worst. worst. Uh, this pairwise comparisons, this data was then used uh, to train what they call a reward model which is typical for uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. This reward model was then used in the in step three, uh, which is uh, policy optimization with a PPO, um, proximal policy optimization algorithm, and uh, the resulting the resulting instruct GPT model uh, is the outcome of of this policy optimization. Um, you might be wondering why I also put ChatGPT on in the header of the slide. That's because uh, ChatGPT is uh, believed to be trained the same way. Uh, the same methodology is believed to be behind ChatGPT. Why is it believed to be? Because there is no research paper, there is no technical report. And uh, the assumption is that the difference lies mo mostly in the training data. So ChatGPT was trained on more data and more chat-oriented prompts, more chat-oriented instructions. Uh, both InstructGPT and ChatGPT, due to their similarity, are often referred to as GPT-3.5 models. Uh, GPT-3, 3.5, and other similarly large models are typically served uh, via APIs, which are often paid, or remain publicly unavailable. This situation leads, of course, to development of open source alternatives. Let me tell you about two of them, uh, two initiatives actually related to, to open models. The first one is Eleuther AI, which is an in independent group of researchers who are trying to reproduce GPT-3 to the largest possible extent and make it open. They started in 2021 with a release of a data set called The Pile, which is uh, an eight, 800 gigabytes of text. They obtained the data mostly via web crawling. Then they used the pile to train three consecutive GPT uh, variants, GPT-Neo, GPT-J, and GPT-Neo-X. All of them are decoders and are increasingly large, with GPT-Neo-X being a 20 billion parameter model. Recently in our uh, project, we were playing a bit with the models and uh, found that GPT-J is actually quite a, quite a decent uh, model with a reasonable number of parameters. Another a contribution from Eleuther AI is LM Evaluation Harness, which is a framework that can be used for evaluation of decoders in the few-shot uh, few -shot learning scenario. The second initiative that I would like to mention is Big Science Workshop, which was a one-year-long workshop, which finished in mid-2022 in which during which uh, more than a thousand researchers from all over the globe uh, collectively trained a model that they called bloom was bloom was a, a multilingual model uh, it, its largest version was actually slightly larger than gpt3 uh, you can also uh, check it in hugging face repository it's available there uh, same as all the models from eluter ai Okay, let's move to uh, very recent history, to 2023. By the end of um, February, Meta AI released a model that also kind of went viral, a model they called Llama, or actually it was a series of models uh, between seven and 65 billion parameters. What's uh, unique, what's distinct about these is that they were trained on publicly available data 
Uh, these are the first uh, large scale models that are fully trained on publicly available data. Uh, unfortunately, even though meta researchers claim that the model is open, uh, its license only allows their, its, uh, the models used, uh, being used in non-commercial settings. Uh, things started getting really fast then. So around 10 days later, in early March, Stanford researchers took LAMA and converted it into uh, an alpaca. Alpaca is the name of their model, which they fine-tuned from LAMA, from the 7 billion parameter LAMA, on um, slightly more than 50,000 instructions that were generated with help of Instruct GPT. So they followed this self-instruct idea. It was not really expensive. It only cost them $600 in total, out of which $500 were spent on creating the data set with OpenAI API. And uh, the rest, the remaining $100 were spent on three hours of training the model in the cloud. What's interesting, at least what they report, is that in the blind evaluation, uh, the model, the Alpaca model, performed on par with a much larger Instruct GPT model uh, according to hum human preferences. Uh, uh, still in March 2023, um, the community started doing a lot of stuff. So uh, during this month, the last month, a lot of open source initiatives and repositories around LLM started appearing every day, uh, including open alternatives to ChatGPT, including a 40 million instruction data set that was synthetically created, and also approaches to um, algorithms on about like that allow to use LLMs or train LLMs in limited hardware scenario. For example, related to uh, quantized inference code, uh, there is also a successful attempt to port LAMA to C++. And uh, a very important uh, direction is of research is the efficient fine-tuning methods. For example, very recently, an Alpaca LoRa model was released, and LoRa stands for low rank adaptation, which is another uh, method that we found very useful in our recent project. It allowed to uh, train uh, larger models in the limited, uh, limited uh, hardware scenario. So I recommend you to go to the paper or to some, uh, some texts about LoRa and, and learn what it actually is. OK, here we are back, uh, back to GPT-4, because OpenAI quickly responded to the rapid pace of other, other initiatives with the announcement of GPT-4. It was uh, precisely on the 14th of March. They released a technical report for GPT-4. But unfortunately, again, they don't want to share uh, too much. They, the, many of the details remain, remain undisclosed. Uh, in order to access the model, you have to pay the subscription fee and join the wait list. Fortunately, it takes a reasonable amount of time to, to be accepted. So you can experiment with GPT-4. And for now, it only works with text. But as I said in the beginning, it's soon uh, expected to also uh, allow image input. And uh, let me repeat that again. Microsoft researchers recently wrote a uh, report about GPT-4, its capabilities, and they compared it. it. They say that they view it as an early but still incomplete version of AGI, the Artificial General Intelligence. Um, another big announcement from uh, OpenAI uh, arrived 10 days later. So they announced ChatGPT plugins, which allow the ChatGPT model to access internet and to interact with other tools and services, for example, to retrieve some additional and uh, what's most, most important up-to-date knowledge, because the original ChatGPT was trained on data uh, that ended in 2021, and it had no clue what happened in the world afterwards. So now we, we, are, we will be able to uh, make ChatGPT uh, extract this knowledge from some external sources. And this would allow to mitigate the well-known uh, hallucination issue that LLMs in general suffer from. Uh, it's the issue that they come up with facts that don't really uh, make sense, that are untrue. Okay, uh, to conclude my presentation, the summary, let me, uh, let me share a few key takeaways about the recently developed large language models again. First of all, they are typically decoders, so they are trained to predict the next word or the next token in a sequence. 
they are uh, they learn to do that by being tuned on large collections of of text in particular text framed as instructions which leads to uh, zero shot inference capabilities of these models uh, LLMs can be used either via paid APIs or hosted in the cloud, as well as in an on-premises environment. And uh, it seems that LLMs are now at the forefront of the AI revolution that's happening in front of our, our eyes. Uh, businesses across all industries and uh, all, uh, all over the globe are, hardly, har are pondering how they can leverage the technology. And it's expected that soon the entire, not only businesses, but the entire society will need to learn uh, how to interact with LLMs on, an, on a daily basis. And uh, that's all from me. Uh, thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed uh, my description of the AI revolution with large language models.